crossing over begins in prophase one, so in, that first, in the prophase step of the first meiotic division, as homologous chromosomes pair up gene by gene, so they pair up precisely. Okay. okay. So in crossing over, okay, homologous portions of, portions of two sister chromatids can change places. Okay. And then this contributes to the genetic variation. This allows alleles to segregate randomly, okay, or semi-randomly. We'll see that we can in fact calculate how far apart genes are based on how often they actually are able to cross over. Okay. So just to again schematically illustrate what goes on. Okay. So again, we have. Um, the prophase of meiosis one, so we have the sister chromatids, right? But now, unlike in mitosis, the homologous chromosomes actually line up together. They pair up like this, okay? But what happens is these structures called chiasma form, okay, between the sister chromatids that are closest to each other. And basically, the DNA can break and reattach, but when it reattaches, it attaches over to the sister chromatid, okay? And so that allows a mixing of the pieces that come from mom versus dad, okay? So the end result is a chromosome that still has all the same genes, but it contains new combinations of those genes that are originally separate from, separately inherited from the mother or the father of the generation before. And that's most il easily illustrated just by coloring these blue and red again. So you have these crossover events that occur, but then they separate, okay? And then again, the anaphase will pull these apart, right, as homologous chromosomes. So now you end up with this. And so you can see now that after this, you get one copy that's the same as the blue chromosome, one copy that's the same as the red. But then each of these contain crossover events. So they contain new combinations of blue and red, okay? So if you have like a gene P, it's not that one of them has an extra P gene on it, right? They still have the same number, but they contain new combinations of P plus and P minus that come from mom and dad, okay? People, this is what you been doing when you think about mapping if you're taking a lab at the same time, okay? And so that, and then with the next division, they segregate like that, and then this is your recombinant, what we call the recombinant chromosomes, all right? And the simple rule is, is that if two genes are far apart on the chromosome, then they're very likely to be separated by a chiasma and then end up looking like they segregate randomly, okay? And the number of, of these crossovers that appear on a chromosome varies with its length and the species and things like that. There's always at least one per arm on every chromosome, okay? And so then this happens and you get these new combinations. So if you go back through that example with the with the three uh, alleles or the three genes of the different alleles, A, P, and Z that we talked about, you can think then what happens if you're able to have that recombination occur, then you could get A minus P minus C minus, okay, by having crossover events that would mix up the two parts of chromosome three that came from mom and from dad. Okay. So then just to show you how the book shows you this, right? And again, the details are in some way similar to mitosis. So you go through this formation of the chiasma and then you line up homologous chromosomes and you go through very similar to what you do in mitosis. You have the centrosomes, you have microtubules that connect, but now they're connecting to these homologous pairs of chromosomes. And then when they pull them apart, so it's not only the sister chromatids that are originally together, but it's the homologous chromosomes. You get the crossover events and then you start to separate them. Okay. And they separate and they go towards the poles and that's the end of meiosis one. Okay. And this again is in right out of your textbook. Okay. And then you go through uh, meiosis two, where then you divide each of these again and now the chromosomes line up again, but now they're not in homologous pairs, right? And then they get separated and you end up then with a sperm and egg being haploid. All right. So now just to, to make sure you understand how this is different from mitosis, there are two very important differences that occur. One is that, well, a couple, two or three. So one is that when you line up the chromosomes at metaphase, okay, here you've got, if we have an N of, uh, N of three or two N of six, you've got six different things that you're dividing up. But you've only got three here because the homologous chromosomes are actually paired together. Okay. So when you divide this, you get sister chromatids separated. But when you divide this, you've got homologous chromosomes separated. Okay. And this is where I said it's confusing that they call this haploid. I would call that, still call that diploid. And then it divides again, and that's when you get clearly haploid cells. Okay, and that's how you make sperm So the key differences are how you line these things up at metaphase. Okay, the fact that at the next division you don't undergo DNA synthesis, you don't replicate the chromosomes before meiosis two. So you're cutting down the DNA, uh, the amount of DNA now to half. Okay, all right. So that's how you go through it. And this is just a table that again lists those key differences. And again, this is straight out of the book, just to, to uh, highlight again the differences that are important. So in terms of DNA replication, so for every mitotic division you're having an S phase first, you're undergoing DNA replication and dividing. But that's not true for meiosis. You're only having uh, S phase or replication before meiosis one, and not before meiosis two. Okay, so you're going to end up cutting down the amount of DNA because of that. Okay, and, um, and then for each cycle of mitosis, we just think of one round of division, but meiosis involves two rounds of cell division. Okay. Um, and then after the end of mitosis, you go from one cell to two cells, and both are two ends still. But in the case of meiosis, right, because you have two rounds of division, you go from one cell to four in the end, and then each of those is haploid. Okay. And then there are roles. So in, in an animal body, in, in a typical animal, right, mitosis is what allows you to go from one cell to two to four to eight when you're making a zygote, an embryo, and you know, turning into a human or a frog or whatever it's destined to be. So you go from one to many billions or trillions of cells, and that's by the process of mitosis. Okay. But meiosis is used when you're making gametes okay, in animals. So that's how you're making sperm and egg. Okay. And so that's that sort of life cycle, life history is illustrated here, that most of your life, of course, all of your cells are you're diploid, but then sperm and egg are made, and those are where haploid cells are. Okay. And then the fusion of sperm and egg is what gets you back to a diploid. Okay. So the haploid state is very transient. Okay. And that's how it is for most animals, that, that, that this, product, this process of meiosis is used to make a gamete, and it's a very transient uh, phase. Right? But that's not true for all other organisms. So for example, in, in quite a number of plants and in some algae, the haploid individual actually has a life of its own and hangs around for quite a while. Okay? So you alternate uh, between having a uh, haploid form of the organism and a diploid form of the organism. And an example of that occurs in mosses and ferns. So you look at mosses and ferns and you don't realize this, but they actually have two stages to their life. And they look sometimes like similar plants, sometimes they look like slightly different plants. And you can get a phase, a plant that's actually a diploid form, okay? and it's going to undergo meiosis. But it's not just forming sperm and egg, it's actually forming a plant that's a male and a female, but they're haploid. And they grow up as plants that you would recognize. Okay? So when you see ferns, you have male ferns and female ferns, but the, each of them are actually haploid. And so they have a very simple time forming gametes, of course, because they don't have to, they've already undergone meiosis. And so those fuse and they make a new diploid form of the plant. Okay? So like I said, that occurs in mosses, ferns, liverworts, and things like that. What we call the higher plants, right? the, the, the later lineages of plant evolution. Are, um, the gametes are more like what we think of animals with pollen and eggs. Okay. Um, and then there are some organisms that actually sort of are the reverse. They spend most of their life as haploids, and the diploid state is very transient. So their cells are actually haploid most of the time. They're dividing as haploids, and they're carrying on their lives as haploids. And then when conditions get bad, okay, they actually undergo, uh, they actually 
then they mate, essentially. They fuse, and they form diploids, and then they release spores. Um, but those are haploid, and then they spend most of their time as haploids. So what that does is it allows them to recombine their chromosomes by going through that, but most of the time they spend as haploids. And a good example of that, or most fungi and some protists do this, so a good example is yeast, right? The baker's yeast, anything like that. When you're growing a yeast culture, it's actually just haploid cells. But if they run out of food, they'll actually then revert to going to a diploid and making spores, which are very resistant to drying out in bad conditions. And then they then can continue their life that way. Okay? They'll again form haploids again when they start growing. There are also some animals that are haploid. Okay? Um, and a good example are bees and ants. Okay, so if you look at an ant colony, you'll have a single queen, usually, right? Big ant that's laying all the eggs. And she's attended to by various workers. So there's workers and there's soldier ants, right? And those are all female, okay? And they're all diploid. But every now and then males get made, but males are actually haploid, okay? And in fact, the way males get formed with ants and bees is that they're eggs that didn't get fertilized, okay? And then those are the males, so they're haploid, okay? Actually, it's a kind of an interesting scheme because it means that so female bees and ants, they mate and then they hold on to the sperm for a long time. The, when they mate, the male gets plenty of sperm over and she holds them. And she uses them during her lifetime to fertilize eggs and keep making fertile eggs, which are all the workers and soldiers, all the diploids, right? But if she runs out of sperm, she starts to make males, right? And then actually there's a way that she could mate then. But it's a little more complicated than that. That's a simple way of thinking about it. And so the males are actually haploids and they only form when an egg doesn't get fertilized, right? And so there's also certain times of years which will make, certain time of the year which will make actually males and then new queens and males can fly off. But the males are very transient and not seen that often. So probably you've seen male ants sometimes. If you ever suddenly notice that there's all these things that look like ants with wings and they land on the ground and the wings fall off of them, those are male ants. Okay. And they're again very uncommon actually. Okay, so um, again they come from unfertilized eggs. Okay. Uh, all right, so then there, we talked about then this process of crossing over, okay? And we'll end here in just a few minutes. Okay, so, um, and it's this process of recombination that allows alleles on the same chromosome to sort independently, right? And so Thomas Hunt Morgan, who's a famous fly geneticist, right? He argued that the closer two genes were on a chromosome, right, the more likely it should be that they should fail to sort independently, okay? So it makes sense. If you only have a few chiasma forming, right, let's say one per arm of the chromosome, then in fact, if the two, the two different genes are very close together, the chance of that chiasma forming between them, right, and allowing them to recombine gets smaller as the distance between those two genes gets smaller. Okay. So that was a, a general conclusion he came to. And then there was a person who worked with Morgan called Sturdivant, and he actually proposed, well, actually, we could quantitatively then measure the distance between genes okay, by calculating how often recombination occurred between them. Okay. And then this is the basis of genetic mapping, okay, figuring out a distance. Okay. So if you have two genes on two different chromosomes, and you don't have to copy the details down here. This is just a very traditional cross where you have something that's, uh, you know, again, a recessive allele, rosy, that's on one chromosome, and something we call thick veins on another. They're on different chromosomes. You have males. In this case, you have you know, these different genotypes. So you've got one that's uh, one animal that's homozygous mutant for rosy, the other one is homozygous mutant for thick veins. And you make this cross, and you ask, well, what progeny do you get, and what frequency do you get them? I'm sorry. And, the, yeah. and so what frequency do you get? And then you take those F1s, and you make them to each other, and you ask, well, what do you get? And again, that's the simple Mendelian ratio that you should get a one to one to one to one. Okay? So you're now crossing the heterozygous F2s to each other. And now in the next generation, you get all of these different combinations of genotypes. Okay? So that kind of ratio. There's nothing unusual there. Okay? But what happens, though, is if I draw them like this, now if I have a different uh, mutation. We're calling this one FZ. It's on the same chromosome as Rosie, okay? the RY. And so now we have a cell that's heterozygous for both. But it's heterozygous because one chromosome has the two mutant alleles, and the other chromosome has the two wild type alleles. Okay? And so now if we cross this, we get these numbers. Okay? Um, and so now you should see something wrong. Okay? So they're not one to one to one to one anymore. Okay? There's a skewed ratio of what's happening here. Okay? So again, this was the, the cross that we're making. In this case, we're, we now are taking this, and we're crossing it to something that's homozygous mutant for all of those genes. We should be getting equal numbers of all of these, okay? but we're not. And you can you know, sit down and go through this slowly on your own, too, to make sure you follow it. And you're not getting equal numbers. Okay? And that's the basis for mapping. So if you look at this, this is what we call the parental configuration. So you don't have to worry about this chromosome, because dad here was homozygous mutant for everything. So that's always the same chromosome, right? Because all we make are chromosomes that are rho z minus, f z minus. But this was mom, okay? And so she had one chromosome that was minus minus, and another one was plus plus. And so these we would call the parental configuration, because they're still minus minus and plus plus. So those are parental. These are the recombinant ones now, where pluses with minus, okay? And so we can calculate distance, okay, by looking at the percentage of recombinants over the total. So in this case, we have 203 recombinants, okay, over 210, and that gives us a 10% recombination frequency, and we call this 10 math units. So we would say that those two genes are 10 math units apart, okay, because we're getting a skewed ratio. All right. And I'll give you some problems. And you've, if, you've been in the, if you've been taking the lab, you've done some of these, I'll give you a few additional ones just to make sure. So if two genes are very, very far apart, then the greatest number of map units you can end up with is 50, right? So there's random uh, assortments in there. Okay? But the smaller that recombination frequency, the closer together those genes are, the smaller the, number, the map unit number you get. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with a problem then just to see that you understand this. And we'll do this as a clicker question at the start of the next lecture. Okay? So imagine this case, right? So, so you and a friend are doing experiments in the lab. And you take a female, let's just pretend these are flies, right? You take a female fly that's heterozygous for both rosy and frizzle. So that was the RY and the FZ gene, right? And those are both um, recessive mutations okay, that you have alleles for. Uh, and you made it with a male that's homozygous mutant for both rosy and frizzle, okay? And you get these numbers, okay? But you have a friend, in quotes, okay? And they say, well, I've done the exact same thing as you. I took a female that was heterozygous for both rosy and frizzle, okay? And I also made it into a homozygous mutant for rosy and frizzle male, and I got these numbers, okay? So what you need to do is explain why you get different, why you get different answers, okay? So think about that, and then that's where we'll start the next lecture, all right?